And since, uh, since Koch is first and foremost an ideological movement and not a political party, one of the problems we had with JDL was that, despite the fact that people did not realize it, JDL was also primarily an, an ideological movement, not merely an activist group. And what happened was, therefore, that many, many people joined and didn't really know what they were joining. They thought they knew what they were joining. They didn't really know. Uh, many people joined JDL because they saw it as, as an opportunity uh, to hit. Nothing wrong with hitting the right people. But if you join a group because you want to hit, invariably you will end up hitting the wrong people too. And an ideological mo movement teaches you whom to hit and whom not to hit. And that violence is sometimes necessary and sometimes it is, it is wrong. Only when one, and only when one has an ideological bent does one know what to do and what not to do at the right time. And in great measure, Kass, certainly in Israel, the overwhelming majority of, uh, of voters for Kass think that Kass is a, a movement that was dedicated, that was created to throw the Arabs out of Israel, which is of course not true. Kass is an ideological movement with an overview of the Jewish people and with a great many, many stands on a great many, many issues. An overview. One of the issues is the question of, of Arabs in, inside Israel. But hardly the only issue, and certainly uh, even on that issue alone, uh, people don't understand what Kahn wants from Arabs, what doesn't want from Arabs. And so it's important that if that Kach, first of all, begin to put out leaders. Secondly, even the ordinary members should know exactly what Kach is, and above all, what Kach is not. And so we decided to hold a series of uh, seminars, perhaps two or three a year, in which people would hopefully come and take notes, which is why you're here, this isn't a speech, it's a seminar to take notes and to ask questions and to walk out, out of here with a little greater knowledge of what Kach really is, and in essence, what Judaism really is, because Kach is not an island of <coughs> itself. Everything that it draws, it draws from Judaism and from halacha. And uh, one of the important things is, not only for someone who doesn't know Judaism to, to know what Judaism says on these, on these issues, but even more to the point, many Orthodox Jews who think that they know what Judaism says, and they really don't, they should know what it really says and not what they were taught in their school by people who also think that they know what it says and who don't know. Uh, today what we'll, what we'll do is we'll divide the seminar in time to two parts. The first part will be devoted to a substantive uh, area of what is the Jewish people in terms of Judaism, what is the land of Israel, and so on and so forth, the relation of Jews and, and, uh, and non-Jews in uh, Judaism. And the second part will be uh, a, a seminar dedicated to uh, Kach policy over the years and cost policy in the future. So uh, the first part will be given over to the question of the Jewish people, what is the Jew in terms of uh, Judaism? And, and, and at a time when everybody's talking about who is a Jew, by far the greater question is, why is a Jew? Why is a Jew? Who is a Jew? Who cares who is, a Jew, who is a Jew or not, if one doesn't know why one sh should be a Jew? If we don't know why one should be a Jew, who cares who is a Jew?
the Jewish people, the essence of the Jewish people is that it is a chosen people. The essence is that it is not like all the other nations. When you study uh, government, political science in school, they always have a basic course which tells you how people beget, how nations beget. And in theory, they will tell you that nations began in one of two ways, perhaps. Um, first of all, there were families and tribes. And gradually, there was a problem. A strong tribe started beating up all the other tribes. Or a foreign tribe started beating up all these other tribes. And so they gathered together for protection, for protection. And so they will tell you that self-defense and protection is the origin of nationalism. That's how nations began. That tribes gave up their independence for the sake of protection. Well, people turned to a king and said, okay, we'll make you king if you protect us. We exchange our freedom for that. And Gradually, that's how the tribes came together and became a nation. Or others will uh, tell you that. There are other theories that uh, various groups who lived along a certain river, and gradually, in order to guarantee that each of the people would have the proper and equal amount of water rights, so they got together and they organized a group, all of the people living along the uh, river were organized together. And eventually, from that came forth. That's not relevant. That isn't important. Whatever the reason that nations evolved naturally, the Jewish people did not evolve naturally. The Jewish people did not become a people through evolution. There was a specific moment in Jewish history when the Jewish people became a people. First of all, this concept of a Jewish people. And I think it is very important that every time that we speak, we have sources. We have sources, because anybody can give views and opinions, but if you're speaking about Judaism, then you have to give sources in Judaism. Otherwise, if you're not going, going to base your views on, on sources within uh, Judaism, then if your name is Cohen, then you're giving Cohenism, which is fine, but don't call it Judaism. The first time that we find the, the promise of, of God that he will create a special people is to Abraham. It's in Genesis chapter 17, in which God says the following to, to Abraham. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Over here we, we find that Abraham was chosen as the person through whom a nation will be born. The nation has not yet been born here. But what we do have here is the father of the nation is, is chosen. Again, that's in Rashid, Genesis chapter 17. And there, God says, from you, through you, I begin a nation. I begin a nation. And the nation will be a chosen nation. I have chosen that. And furthermore, it also adds not only a nation, but also a land. And we'll come back to this question of the land soon, because the Jewish people is not only a chosen people in a very special way, it is also a different kind of of people. It is the only religion or religion nation which is also land centered. One doesn't have to be, one doesn't have to live in any particular country to be a Catholic. But Judaism is land centered. And so he continues and he says, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, of Canaan, for an everlasting possession 
and I will be their God. Now, the Arabs oftentimes jump on this and say, you see, Abraham was promised the land. It was promised to him and his seed. Now, it's true that Isaac was his son, but so was Ishmael. And they will jump on this thing with self and And Jews who, of course, know nothing about them. Or any, anything else, Jewish, Jewish. Of course, that sounds good, you know. That sounds good. But he continues and he says, in the same chapter, he says, And as for Yishmael, I have heard him. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful. And will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac. So that is the clear, first of all, since when did Arabs look upon the Bible as any kind of a source? That's the first thing. You know, all, all of a sudden the, the Bible, the Bible, you see, they see the Bible says. But if they're going to use the Bible already, very, very important that people don't pick and choose their Bible. If you're going to say, if you're going to pick one verse here, finish it. Don't, never, never take, take things out of context. Over here, it's quite clear who the seed is. The seed is clear. Ishmael will be a great man and a prince and everything else, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac. That's clear. And not with Ishmael. The promise continues from uh, Abraham to Isaac. And in Rashid chapter 26, we find a famine has broken out in Canaan. And Isaac wants to leave. He wants to leave. He wants to leave because there's famine. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed I will give all these lands, and I, and I will perform the oath which I swore unto Abraham thy father. Right. So we see the chosenness has now been passed on from the father of the uh, nation to the second, Isaac. And that, in turn, continues with Jacob. When Jacob is about to flee his brother, Esau, Esau. So Isaac blesses him before he flees. And in Rashid chapter 28, And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him. And he said, And God Almighty shall bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee. Once again, we see that one of the sons and not the other is chosen. He, he also has two sons. Isaac also has two sons. Yaakov and Esau. Jacob and Esau. But the blessing is given to Jacob and not to Esau. And he says, And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land wherein thou art a stranger, the land which God gave unto Abraham. So what we have here are three blessings already. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. The three patriarchs, the three fathers. And indeed, God himself says it to Jacob. He doesn't only depend upon Isaac passing it on. When Isaac flees, and he dreams as his famous dream of the ladder and everything else, so God speaks to him and he says, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land where, whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And so, what we have here, what we have, is the choosing of the patriarchs from whom there will be a nation created. The choosing of the 
patriarchs from whom will come a chosen nation. And in Sefer Shemot, in the book of Exodus, in chapter 6, God now speaks to Moses. By this time, the Jewish people were there, and they're not yet a people. They were still called throughout this area, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel. These are still the families. These are tribes. There is no na nation yet. It is only the, the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that was promised that they would be a nation. And so God speaks to Moses and he says, And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be to you a God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you in onto the land concerning which I did swear to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you for an heritage. I am the Lord. Now we have suddenly something else now. After the first three patriarchs, at that point, anyone who was born from Jacob, was part of the seed. In the case of Abraham, God was not yet sure which of Abraham's children would be worthy. And so he decided Isaac would and not Ishmael. In the case of Isaac, he wasn't sure which of his two children would be worthy. And he decided that Jacob, yes, and Esau, not. By the time there were these three patriarchs, what you have here is a presumption of chosenness. And from that point on, everyone who was born a Jew was going to be part of the chosen people. They're not yet a people. They're still tribes. They're still the children of Israel, but the promise is there. And now they come to, by the way, that was in, the, in Shemot chapter 6, Exodus chapter 6. And now they come to Har Sinai, to Mount Sinai, Sinai. And in chapter 19 in Shemot, in Exodus, he now comes, and this is the moment of Jewish history. This is what is going to make this people different from all other peoples. Everyone else evolves. No one, no one knows at what moment in, in history the English became a people, or the French became a people. It was an evolution. There was a specific moment in Jewish history when the Jews as tribes became a nation, a people, and that is at, at Sinai. And so right before Mount Sinai, right before the giving of the uh, Torah, God speaks to, to Moses in chapter 19 and he says, Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then shall you be a special treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This is the chosenness. They're a chosen nation. And above all, they're a holy nation. They're a holy nation. And we'll come back to this concept of of what being holy is, because in this lies the whole question, why did God choose the Jewish people? God doesn't just decide to choose people. He chooses people for a reason and for a mission. We'll come to that soon. But what we're looking at, at now is the whole question of chosenness. And the interesting thing, thing is that on this verse, in which it says, God calls Moses and he, and he says, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and tell the children of Israel, you will be my, if, you, if you obey my, my voice indeed and keep my uh, covenant, then you should be a special people and uh, a king of a priest and a holy nation. On this verse, the commentator Rashi has an interesting comment. And he brings that from the uh, Medrash. He says, tell them this, Nothing less than this and nothing more than this. The, this is the first message 
that God is giving to the Jewish people per se, and not just to Moses. He says, go down and tell them the following message. Don't add anything, and don't detract from it. Just tell them this. Here, what, what is so important to insist that don't add anything to it. Don't bring in Shabbos and don't bring in Glock Potion. Don't, don't, any, don't bring anything at all. Just say this. And the answer is because this is the foundation of the Jewish people. To be different and special and holy and separate. If you're that, then the other laws will fall into place. But to bear in mind that you are chosen, that you are special, that you are different, that you are separate. That is the essence of being a Jew. Because then you'll ask, well, if I'm different, I'm special, I'm chosen, how am I chosen? What am I supposed to do to be different? Then we'll get on to the rest. It's very, very much the same question is a very, very interesting, remarkable uh, portion of the uh, Talmud, it discusses the reason why the second temple was destroyed. I think there's a whole bunch of bunch of reasons. And one of the reasons given is a, a very peculiar one. It says, because they did not make the first blessing over the Torah. That's a, that's a very, rather strange thing. Because they didn't make the first blessing over the Torah, that's why the temple was destroyed. And the, and the answer is obvious, really. I mean, it's an obvious answer. What is the first blessing of the, in the, the Torah? Asher b'chalbanu mikol amin, who has chosen us from all the nations. If the Jew does not say that, and does not believe that, and does not act upon that, I am chosen from all the nations, and therefore I separate myself from, from them, from that will then come all, he'll, he'll, he'll then be like everybody, and from that will come a disruption. So, here is the first time, the first time that God speaks to, to, the Jew, to the Jewish people through Moses, and he says, tell them this is the fundamental message. You're a chosen people, you're a special people, a nation of priests, a holy nation. And this theme is said over and over and over again. I mean, I, I can't possibly go over every, everything, but I do want to give you all of these, sor these sources because it's imperative that you know these sources and that you jot these sources down and see them so that you'll become scholars in the proper way, in the right way. In Dvarim, Eric Zion, Deuteronomy chapter 7. So God again goes and he says the following. He says to the, to the, uh, to the Jews, as follows. He says, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. Now, one can't get more racist than that. Mm -hmm. now, obviously this is not racism. Obviously not. Any non-Jew, and that's the reason why Judaism has conversion. Any non-Jew who wants to be chosen can be chosen by joining the Jewish people. And then he too is chosen. Chosenness is not a racial concept. It's not an ethnic concept. Jews are certainly not a race. Of course not. Jews aren't even an ethnic people with all of the converts that have come in from different, from, from different races and from different peoples. Nevertheless, we are chosen. We are above all the peoples. If, any, if all the peoples would like to be on our level, so join us. But if you don't join us, then know that we are on a higher spiritual level. The same thing is said over and over again in chapter, in, uh, chapter 14 in uh, Dvarim, Deuteronomy. Again, for thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. And the Lord hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth.
And again, in chapter 26, and it's important to note how many times the Torah repeats this, because it knows the Jewish people. It knows that Jews don't want to be chosen. I just don't want, I, Jews want nothing more than to be just like every, everybody else. Not worse than everyone else, but not better than anyone else. Because if you're better than people, hate you. I don't want to be hated, right? Well, too big. <laughs> the point is that, the point is that that's exactly what the Talmud means when it says, why was the mountain upon which the Torah was given called Sinai? So it comes from the Hebrew word sina, which means hatred. It was from there came forth hatred. Two kinds of hatred. First of all, hatred of God to the, to the nations that refused to accept the Torah. And secondly, hatred of the nations to the Jewish people for being chosen. But it is a hatred which we cannot escape. Because one cannot escape his chosenness. Whether we like it or don't like it, we cannot escape being a Jew. And so again, chapter 26 in uh, Dvarim, Deuteronomy, he says again, Thou hast chosen the Lord this day to be thy God and to walk in his ways and to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and to hearken unto his voice. And the Lord hath chosen thee this day to be his special people as he hath promised thee and to make thee high above all the nations which he hath made in praise and in name and in honor, that thou mayest be a holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken. Clearly what we have here is a condition. We are chosen to keep God's commandments. Now the fact that if a Jew gets up and says, I don't want to be chosen, and, and I won't keep the commandments, too late. Too late. The covenant is made, and, it's, and it, it, is, it is an unbreakable. The covenant is, is made. It's too late. And so, in Dvarim, in chapter 30, God speaks to the Jews, and he says as follows. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. And that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that thou mayest live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thy goest to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. This is the essence of the basic Jewish concept of free will. This is free will. God sets before the Jew life and death, the good and evil. And he says, choose good. No one forces a Jew to do good. <coughs> forces a Jew to do evil. No one forces a Jew to do anything. We have free will. And so therefore we cannot es escape it by, by saying, God is, everything is pre destined, and therefore I had no choice. Whatever I did was predestined. That is not the Jewish way. That's Calvinism. But that is not Judaism. Judaism declares that the Jew has a choice. Whatever he wants to do. You want to do good? You want to do good. You want to do evil? You'll do evil, but you'll pay for it. Isn't that it's true that you have freedom to, to do what you want? but you have an obligation to do the right thing. And so this is the essence of the Jewish people. They are a special people, they are a chosen people, and in Pirkei Avot, in, in Ethics of the, uh, of the Fathers, in the third chapter, it says, Blessed is Israel, who are called the children of God, a special love, was granted unto them. God loves all his children, all his creatures. But a special love was granted to them. Chiba yitera. Really it should mean an extra love. An extra love, a special love was granted to the Jewish people so that 
when people say, but aren't all men created in God's image? Of course they were all created in God's image. But a special love was given to the Jewish people. Not to mention the fact that when, that when people say, weren't all men created in God's image, what they really mean is the men that they think we shouldn't do anything bad to, like, like Arabs. But if it is true that all men were created in God's image, which he is true, so was Hitler. So was Stalin. And he just come. Everyone was created in God's image. What God looks at is what the person did to the image after he was created with it. That's the difference. Of course you were created in God's image. The question is, what did you do to my image? Uh, year, years ago, there was a famous book by Oscar Wilde, The Picture of Dorian Gray. And it's in the, in the book, I don't know the story, but eventually the hero of the book has a portrait of himself. He is a handsome, perfect person, and so is the portrait. And he stays perpetually untouched and young, and apparently perpetually unchanged. But the changes are shown in the picture, and the picture becomes ugly. Well, uh, the image of God, which is in an evil person, becomes ugly. You don't see it, perhaps, on the person, but in the image, it's there. It becomes ugly, it becomes twisted, it becomes corrupt. In the Medrash, in the uh, Tanchuma, in, uh, in the Medrash it says, The Holy One, blessed be He, created the 70 nations in the world. But of them all, he found pleasure only in Israel. That's the message. That's Judaism. In all, he found pleasure only in Israel. Judaism sets down this concept of the Jews as a chosen people, and furthermore, in Judaism, there is something very, very different. Judaism is the only, Judaism is the only faith in which the entire people saw the great event. When Judaism began, it was given to the whole people. Now consider carefully. First of all, consider carefully other faiths. Uh, Islam. In Islam, the fundamental belief is that the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad and gave him the Quran. Yeah. The next day he woke up and he said, guess what? The angel Gabriel came to me. He gave me the Quran. If you believe him, you believe him. If you don't believe him, you don't believe him. Nobody saw it except Muhammad who claims to that that this happened. If you have faith, you have faith. If not, not. In Christianity, it's a little bigger. The uh, circle of people that claim to have seen miracles, a little, a little bit bigger. How many more? Several tens claim to have seen miracles. In Judaism, God knew that if he, first of all, he knew the Jewish people. And if Moses would show up one day and say, guess what? God spoke to me and gave me a Torah. Can you imagine what they would, they would do to Moses? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the cynical articles and the cynical books and the cynical comments and on television and on radio, some nut named Moses came and said, and if he would have given it to 70 great rabbis, it, it, it would have been the same thing. There were 70 other rabbis who didn't get it would have said, ah, it's a lot. We didn't get it. 
So what happens here is that in Judaism, something very, very special happens. God decides to give the Torah to the whole Jewish people. Every man, woman, child, cat, dog, cow, sheep, everything. Everyone is going to see this event. And so, we find in, in Shemot, in Exodus, in chapter 19, we find again, and it came to pass on the third day, in the morning, and there was thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon, upon the mount. And the voice of the horn, exceeding loud, so that all the people in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And now Sinai was all together with smoke, because the, the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the horn sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him by a voice. And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the horn and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they heard the voice of God. They heard the voice of God. And so, when Moses is about to die, he tells the people, he, he reminds them in Varim, chapter 4. In Deuteronomy, cha chapter 4, we find that Moses is tell tells them again, he says, Remember, remember, he said. Did ever a people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of fire as thou hast heard it live? Out of heaven he made thee to hear his voice that he might instruct thee. Upon earth he showed thee his great fire and thou heard his words out of the midst of the fire. That is, that is, The reason why the Jewish people don't base their faith upon faith, they base their faith upon observation. And that's why over and over and over again in the Torah, the Torah commands the people, tell your children, I was there, I saw it. Now you tell your child that, that his grandfather told you to tell your child and that he should tell his child. And so the events at Sinai are events that are based upon observation and witness, not upon faith. God doesn't want Jews to have faith because he knows that they are faithless people. They're not going to believe. They doubt everything. They doubt every single thing imaginable until they see it. If I can't see it, if I can't touch it, prove it to me. And so therefore, he said, this, you all saw it. This wasn't something which some, some of the, the chosen rabbis. No, there were no chosen rabbis here. You all saw it. Tell your children. Tell them to tell their children. Tell them to pass it down to their children so that there should be a chain of witnesses to the observation. That is the difference between Judaism and Islam and Christianity. Those, no one saw Muhammad receive the Quran. Nobody. 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 He came and he said, guess what? The angel gave me the Koran. You believe, you believe. You don't believe, you don't. Nobody, how many people even claim to have seen Jesus do miracles? 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever it is in the New Testament. Whatever it is. Even, even claim to have seen it. But over here the claim is made that each and every Jew who was alive at that time saw it. And pass it down to his and her child and so on and so forth. That is the concept of revelation. The revelation is based not upon faith, but upon observation. Upon observation. You know that George Washington lived. How do you know that? How, how do you know that George Washington lived? Did anybody here ever see Washington? No. 
but the next best, best thing imaginable. Those who saw Washington, pass, pass it down. I saw Washington, now write it down, and so on. That's, and that's history. You can't do more, more than that. You, the only way that you can, that you can tell that, that someone who, who personally didn't see the event can believe in it is if the claim is made, we saw the event and we're passing it down to you. That's the most that can, that can be done. And even that doesn't help. But that's the most that can be done. That's the most that can be done. Now, I mentioned before that the, the concept of Jewish chosenness is a concept of holiness. We are, now, Jews weren't just chosen. We are chosen for a certain mission. Obviously, to observe the Torah and so on. But what do you mean to uh, observe it? What is what is the purpose of observing the, the Torah? The purpose is holiness. The purpose is holiness. Over and over and over and over again. Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy. That's the that is a command. That is one of the six hundred and thirteen mitzvot. Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy. That's Commandment, Ikra chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19. It is a, a solemn commandment, two words, Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy. That's a, a commandment, that a Jew is commanded to be holy. And over and over and over and over again, uh, all, these, all these previous sources which I, which, I, which I mentioned, almost all of them, the connect, chosenness was always connected to holiness. You were chosen to be holy. You will be a special people and a holy people. Am Kadosh, a holy people. Now, first of all, let's understand here two things, which we'll come to soon. Am Kadosh, a holy people. Judaism is not a religion. It became one after it was twisted and warped and corrupted in the exile. The Jewish people are a holy people, a religious nation. Of course we have laws to follow, but it's not a religion. We are a nation that is a specifically religious nation, a holy nation, but not just a religion, because if it's just a religion, then you can live in Austria too. And you can be, as the German Jews were, Germans of the Mosaic faith, or Americans of the Jewish Americans, Americans of the of the Jewish faith, and so on. That's not what a Jew is. A Jew is part of the Jewish people, which is a special kind of a people, a holy people, a religious nation, a religious people. We are holy. And in the Psalms, in the Psalms, David writes as follows. And he speaks about why God gave us the, uh, the land. So he says as follows. And he gave them the lands of the nations, and they inherited the labor of the people, that they might observe his statutes and keep his laws. God didn't just take land from After God took the land from people. It belonged to the Canaanite nation. They worked hard, they struggled hard, they built there, and God took it from them and gave it to the Jews, just like that. For reason, for reason, that the Jewish people should be, should follow God's laws and be a holy nation. And again, when it says a nation of priests and a holy nation, the rabbis say, holy, what does holy mean? Hallowed and sanctified separated from the nations of the world and their abominations. And we'll see soon the irrevocable connection between being holy and being separate from the nations. You're not, it is not possible to be holy if you are under the influence of an unholy culture. We'll come to that soon. Let me just go into the question of what does holy mean? What, what's the whole purpose of all the mitzvot? The 
The foundation of all evil in this world is ego. Everything bad in this world has as its source evil. Nobody robs a bank unless he's crazy. Because he has he gets his kick out of robbing banks. Crazy people get the kiss out of robbing banks. The person robs a bank because he wants money. He wants money. Ah, it's not your money. I don't care, but I want the money. Because if I have money, I'll have a car, and I'll have a good life, and I'll enjoy life. In other words, but it's not yours, it doesn't matter. Me, me wants money. I want money. I, I, I want money. And so I'll do things which are wrong to get the money. In each of us is I, me. In each of us. Each of us is born with me. The Bible says, Ki yetzalev ha adam ra min ura. For the inclination of man's heart is wicked from his birth. In other words, you see a child. A child is born, a baby, is the essence of selfishness. This baby doesn't know anything except it's hungry, it wants to eat. Doesn't, doesn't know, doesn't care, its mother is busy, the mother's tired, does not care. Me wants to eat. That's a baby. We're not a baby. A baby is born a totality of selfishness. Nothing in the world matters for this baby. The baby doesn't know anything except me. I'm hungry. I'm wet. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty, I'm cold, me. The world must stop for the baby. We can understand that with the baby. Problem is when people are 50 years old and they're still babies. Oh, that's the problem. That's the problem. Becoming a mature person, and having a baby become mature, the essence of that is that the baby, as the baby grows up gradually, it realizes that there was something else in this world besides it. And it has to wait for its food because the mother's busy. That's called a mature child. And as a person grows older, he should, the purpose of the world is for him to take his I, the I, in the me, and to harness it, and to harness it. Now, obviously, God made people with an ego for a reason. If people didn't have egos, they'd all be carpets. Everybody would, would, everybody would step on them. A person who doesn't have a certain amount of self-respect and self-love is sick. You have to have ego. It's important, but it has to be harnessed. Has to be harnessed. The person has to have self-respect. Of course, a person that doesn't have self-respect can never respect anyone else. A person that doesn't like himself can never like anyone else. One of the great tragedies of our time is that ego is a two-sided sided coin. There are people that love themselves, and people that hate themselves. Both things are wrong. A person should like himself. Don't love yourself and don't hate yourself. Hating yourself and loving yourself are two sides of the same coin of ego, which are bad. Because a person that loves himself and hates himself can never like anyone else. A person that hates himself is as much an, an egotist as a person that loves himself. Because all day he sits around wallowing in his, in his feeling, I'm nothing. All day long he thinks about himself. So there are people that think about themselves in, in terms, I'm great. And there are people that think about themselves, I'm nothing. But all day, both of them think about themselves and nothing else. <laughs> ego is necessary. But ego has to be harnessed. Ego has to be harnessed. And in, in Judaism, we have a concept of Olna Chuchamayim, the yoke of the kingdom of heaven. The mitzvah is a yoke. An ox, when the farmer wants the ox to go and plow a furrow, 
Most ox don't want to plow furrows. If you're an ox, you wouldn't want to plow a furrow. You would want to go up, you see. A vegetable, they want to eat it. So they put a yoke on it to make sure it doesn't go to the right or the left. It goes straight. And yokes are heavy things. Ask and the ox, you see, ask him. A yoke is a heavy thing. <clears throat> and the yoke of heaven is a heavy thing. But it's that which makes the Jew great. Because only an animal does whatever it wants to do. It's hungry, it goes out to eat. It goes out to kill, it goes out to anything. Whatever it wants, it is driven by its instincts, by its needs, by its pleasures, by its pain, it is driven by it. It doesn't control its emotions, its emotions control it. That's an animal. In order for a Jew not to be an animal, and God knows how many two-legged animals grow on this earth, it is incredible. In order for a Jew not to be an animal, he has to overcome his emotions and his in he controls his pleasures. He controls what he wants. And he overcomes it because now is not the time for it. Consider, consider carefully what a mitzvah does really to a person. For example, and I've used this often. For example, let's say a youngster who goes to yeshiva. He's raised in his home. Mitzvahs are. He wants to go to see a double header between the Mets and the, and the Dodgers. His mother knows something about baseball. She knows there's nine innings, nine innings, 18 innings. So she packs him enough sandwiches for 18 innings. Since she doesn't really you know too much about baseball, she, she doesn't know that most Met Dodger games never go nine innings and nine innings. Never 18 innings, 23 innings. And so, the first game goes 17 innings. And he's just about finished the sandwiches for 18 innings. And there's a second game. He has no intention of leaving. But by the fifth inning of the second game, he is hungry. He is very, very hungry. And so is this big, fat slob who's sitting next to him. But he has no, no problem. He sees the hot dog vendor coming. He says, hey, kid, two. Two. He throws the coin. And pass it down to the Frankfurters. And now the Frankfurters are passing down the lane. And the kid is sitting here, and this fat guy is sitting here, and the hot dogs are getting closer. And he can now smell the hot dog. Now, kosher, non kosher, they both smell good. Mm. Frankfurt is not kosher, smells just as good as a kosher Frankfurt. And this kid is really hungry, and he. <coughs> passing down and he now has it in his hands and pass it on and he knows I can't eat because the dog is not kosher. Do you know what that mitzvah has done for that person as a person? To his character? To his ego? This kid is, is, is dying for hunger and all these kids around him can anytime they want to eat, they eat. He can't eat now. He's not an animal. He has to go above that. You consider what that ha if you multiply that by the thousands and thousands of times that that Jew does mitzvahs. You know what that does to the person in terms of making him strong. In terms of of the yoke of heaven. That's what it's about. Not this nonsense. The reason why there's kosher food is because it's sanitary. The reason why we don't eat pork is because you get ringworm from it, or trichinosis from it. You get trichinosis from gefilte fish if it, if it isn't cooked properly. It's nonsense. It isn't health reason. That's absurdity. Absurdity. If you cook pork properly, no one gets, gets sick. Look at these hulking brutes out in, in, in Iowa. They don't get sick. Nothing, nothing to do with being sick. It has to do with a spiritual concept. With a spiritual concept of strength. And the Jew is strong. You don't have to be uh, 
Charles Atlas. He isn't strong. He's not strong. I remember as a kid, he was reading a comic book. This picture with of Charles Atlas going in this, in this little skinny guy is at the beach and with his, his girlfriend and this big, big guy coming to kick sand in his face. And, and, and she says, oh, you coward. And she, she walks away and he says, ah, oh, that's the end of it. And I'm going to buy a chart. And I'm like, ah, it's that's not strength. That's absurdity. Strength is the power within a person to overcome enormous, enormous difficulties. That's strength. And the mitzvah gives the Jew strength. It takes the person's ego and harnesses it. We don't destroy the ego. We sanctify the ego. You don't want to destroy ego. Because otherwise, you're left with some nebuch wimp. You want the ego, but it has to be harnessed to be at the proper time to be used. And not at the improper time. The story told... A classic story, a Hasidic story, about a youngster who was sent away to learn in yeshiva, in Europe. In Europe, it wasn't like, like here. He was sent away. You couldn't come, you couldn't come, come home every single, every single night. You were sent away far away, and to be sent away 300 kilometers. In Europe, you were sent away. And the, the youngster would, uh, would uh, generally stay away for four months, five months, come home either on Pesach or Rosh Hashanah. And so he was away for half a year. Half a year was away. And he came back. It was a stormy night, pouring rain. And he banged on the door, he banged on the door, and the upstairs window opens, and the, and the father looks out and he says, Who's there? And he says, Me, me. The father said, Go back. Go back to Yeshiva. If you have to six months learning to Shiva, you can still say me and expect the whole world to know it's you. You haven't learned anything. Purpose is to get rid of the me. That's the <coughs> harness the me. Harness the I that's inside each and every person. That's the concept of Kedusha. That's the concept of, of the Holiness, holiness. In the Talmud it says, this is an important concept. In the Talmud it says, you, everyone knows or should know, if you don't know, know, that the Jew each day, twice a day, says the Kriyat Shema, Shema Yisrael. And there are three chapters to it. And the rabbis in the, uh, in the Mishnah, in Rachot, ask, why do we first say Shema Yisrael and afterwards we say the second one Vayayim Shamoa and if, you, and, if you, and if you shall hearken on to my commandments. Why do you say that? And why in that order? Why not the other way around? And they answer because before you can take on the, law, the commandments you have to take on you have to take on the yoke of heaven. Why? Because without the yoke of, he of heaven, the commandments mean nothing. There are countless Orthodox Jews in this world who are not religious. Count countless who are mere practitioners of Jewish ritual. They practice the ritual. They practice the ritual. They were born into an Orthodox home. And so that's the way it is. And certainly in this country, it is not difficult to be Orthodox every day. Once upon a time, it was hard. If one didn't work Shabbos, hard to find a job. Today, fine day work week, and the ADL, and the, everybody, and Kolpa, everybody, everything is fine. Kosher, every, everything's kosher today. And I know you, and OK, and I can't, I can't be, X, Y, Z, all kinds of things. Everything is kosher today. It's easy to be kosher. You used to be time for a woman, for a woman, for a, a married woman to cover her, her uh, hair. Today, you have shakos that make the woman look 40,000 times better <laughs> than shako than naturally. So it's pretty easy to keep rituals today. It's hard to keep all machut shamayim because then there are certain laws that you will find that so-called modern, modern wataju simply finds difficult to accept and therefore does not keep it. 
So therefore, the rabbis say, you first have to have to say, Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu Hashem. First of all, say, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. That is accepting upon ourselves the yoke of heaven. If He is God, then whatever He commands, you must do. Then you can accept the commandments. The Mishnah also says, also in Rachel, there is a law in the Torah which says that if you see a nest, a nest, and the mother bird is sitting either on, on eggs or on or, or feeding her you know, newborn uh, birds, and you want to take the eggs or the newborn birds. You must, you must first send away the mud. You must first send away the mud. That's a mitzvah, a little haka, sending away the mother from the nest. Now the Mishnah says what would appear to be a remarkable thing. If someone is walking along the road, he's talking with his, his friend about Torah and so on, he says, ah, how merciful is the Torah. What a merciful thing it is. Look. It even has mercy upon the mother bird. You silence him and say, quiet, you're not supposed to say that. Talmud says, because he makes the laws of God merciful when they are really decrees. Now think of what that is saying. There's a tremendous concept here. How many people keep laws because they agree with them. Countless Jews keep laws because, because they like it. And countless rabbis will take Bale Tshuva and teach him, you see how nice this is? Like, what a nice law. Said, You're right, it's a nice law. <laughs> if you decide to keep laws because you like them, what's going to happen when you come across a law which you don't like? And believe me, there are enough of them around. Which go, which go against the grain of modern, of modern man and modern woman. What do you do then? What you do then is you become a reformed Jew. <laughs> this I like, this I don't like. This I keep, this I don't keep. That's why we silence it. It may be indeed true that this particular law is a law of mercy. But that's not why you keep it. Whether it's merciful or not merciful, you keep it. It's not up to you to, God didn't write a book and then send it out to all the people, you like it? Whether you like it or don't like it, you keep it because it's, it's truth. And you may not, not see it, that's because you're stupid. But if you keep it, you'll eventually see that it is right. You don't come and say, Nice law. Not so nice law. It don't, this isn't some, it's a rating system. Keep the laws. Olma is to is to bind the Jew, to bind him, bind his ego, and make him great. Because freedom comes from keeping laws and not the other way around. A person that doesn't keep any law, eventually becomes a victim and a servant and a slave to his passions and his desires. And he has no way to escape it. He has no way to escape it. I, I, I hear Jews tell me, you fast all day on Yom Kippur? How can you fast all day? That's because this person really and truly cannot conceive of going more than 45 minutes without food. You can't conceive it. You mean to say on Saturday, you can't do this and you can't do that? How can you not do that? That's an animal. That's a weakness. That's a tragedy. That's a slave to himself. A person who says, not only do I fast on Yom Kippur, I fast seven, seven times during the year. Of course I keep the Sabbath. I have the power, the strength to keep the Sabbath and give up things. 
And that's strength. That's strength. That's taking the ego and sanctifying it. And that's taking the animal and turning it into a human being. That's taking that little baby child that is born who is the totality of ego. Eat, I want to eat. Cry, I want to cry. Eat anyone who I want to do. And from that baby comes a human being, a mature adult, rather than the millions of little infants who are 15, 16, 70 years old, who have never, who have never matured and never grown into, into anything more than the same infant. I want, I want, I need, I want, I want my body, my life, my, 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 my. That's the tragedy. These are weak people, and these are people just a little higher than the animals. If that, if that. When God said that man should be a little lower than the angel, just a little lower than the angel. And what he really means is much higher. An angel can't do wrong. It's, it has no capacity to do evil. An angel is programmed to do only good. The greatness of the human being is he could do evil and he chooses to do right. That's greatness. That's greatness. That's greater than the angels. That's why the Torah was given to human beings and not to angels. Angels don't need Torah. Angels are pro. They're like a computer. It's like a robot. It can only do the right thing. Now, I said before the concept of holiness is unequivocally connected to the concept of separation. Separation. It, there must be a concept of separation. And on the, on the verse, which by the way was in, was in yesterday's portion, you should be a a nation of a uh, kingdom of uh, priests and a holy nation. The rabbis, as I mentioned earlier, in the Mechilta, in Yitro, say, hallowed and sanctified, separated from the nations of the world and their abominations. And in Vayikra, it says, <coughs> chapter 20, in Leviticus chapter 20, and you shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy, and have set you apart from the peoples, that you shall be mine. And that classic winging statement in Lamidar, in Numbers chapter 23, Lo, it is a people that shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Judaism demands separation of the Jew from the nation. Because if the Jew is among the nations, he must, he cannot help but be influenced by them. You cannot help but be influenced by them. In this country, the Orthodox Jew in America behaves like an, an American because he's an American. Like gamma rays, the whole culture comes out at you. Newspapers and magazines and radio and television, and just walking in the streets. <laughs> and so the rabbi's comment on this statement, Lo, lo it is the people that shall dwell alone. The Hebrew is Hen Am Levadad Yishko. And the word Hen is translated for some reason in English as Lo, as, as if this is some kind of a poetry. The Torah is not poetry. And the rabbis comment on why hen is used. Hen is spelled hey nun. Hey nun. The rabbis point out in Hebrew, letters are also numbers. Aleph is one, and bet is two, and gimel is three, and dal is four, and hey is five, and so on. So the rabbis say that if you want to take, if you take the number 10, and you want to put together any two letters which will combine to ten is not difficult. You take Aleph, which is one, Tet, which is nine, 
take bet, which is two, you take chet, which is eight, ten, gimel, three, zayin, seven, ten, dalit, four, vav, six, ten. But when you come to hey, hey only has another hey. Hey is five, and five goes together with five. There's no other partner. Hey only has another hey. The same thing with the number 100. You want to take two uh, letters, you can take Yud, which is, is 10, and uh, uh, Sadi, which is uh, 90, and so on and so forth. And then you take 20, and 80, and 30, and 70. When it comes to 50, Nun, Nun is 50. Nun only goes with another Nun. Nun has no partners except another Nun. That's what it says, Hen. Just like Hey only has another Hey. And Nun only has a, another Nun, so a Jew only has another Jew. You're separate, you're apart, you're distinct, in order to be the holy people. Because without that, without that, we will be influenced by all the nations. And look at the American Jew. Look at the tragedy. Look at the tragedy of the American Jew. Freedom for the Jew has always been tragedy. Because the Jew can die in one of two ways, through the ashes of, through the, through the chimneys of Auschwitz, and through assimilation, and intermarriage, and being wiped out as a Jew. And so therefore, God did something which no other faith has. Judaism is a land-centered religion. A religious nation which is commanded to live in a particular country, in a particular land. As I said earlier, you can be a good Catholic if you live in Austria or in Australia. And you can be a good Muslim. You don't have to live in Mecca. The most, you have to visit Mecca once in a lifetime, a Hajj. Once in a lifetime. But you can live anywhere. You can live in, in London. Or in Brooklyn, Atlanta Avenue, you don't have to live on that. <laughs> but the Jew is commanded to live in one specific country. In one specific country. And that is the land of Israel, and for a reason. For a reason. And the land is set over and over and over and from the very first time that we meet Abraham. We find already the commandment to Abraham. Abraham is, is told, Lech lecha, get out of your home. Get out of the country in which you were born. And God speaks to Abraham and he says, Lech lecha This is in Breshit, chapter, chapter 12, Genesis chapter, chapter 4. Get thee out of thy country. And from thy and from thy people, thy uh, kindred, and from thy father's house, unto the land that I will show thee. He didn't even, even know what that land was. He didn't know what that land was. He said, Le leave, leave, leave. And then he said, unto thy seed will I give this land. Eretz Israel, just as we spoke about a chosen people, there is now a chosen land. Rabbi say, the Jewish people is a special people, and the land of Israel is a special people. I will take the special people and put them into the special land. And over and over and over again, I mean constantly, constant, constant, in chapter 15, 15. God says, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. That is, the, that, is, that is the promised land. That is the promised land. The land of Israel doesn't belong to us because of a Balfour. If our an Arab, I'd be right. Who's this Englishman to come and give you my country? And he'd be absolutely right. Some Englishman sitting in London says, you know something, Weizmann, you're a good guy. I'll give you Palestine. 
Who's Balfour? Crazy Jews? So how about, how about Balfour? League of, uh, League of uh, Nations sits, sits down and gives a mandate. Who's the League of Nations? The Arabs are absolutely right. Or the UN. Who's the UN to give away my, my country to the, to the, to the uh, Jews? Absolutely right. Who's Harry Truman? We don't place our, our, our claim upon, upon Israel. The Balfour, League of Nations, Truman, Stalin, UN. This is the claim. The Lord God of Israel gave it onto the Jewish people. Onto the Jewish people, certainly. And over and over and over again, I don't even want to have to go into it, but more and more and more. But just one more, one, just one more, where God says to the Jewish people itself in uh, Barim chapter 11. Every place wherever the soles of your foot shall tread shall be yours from the wilderness even unto Lebanon, from the river, the Euphrates, even unto the, unto the uttermost sea shall your coast be. The land was given to us. And the question here, debate. Divide the land, separate the land. It is yours, it isn't yours, it's partly yours. There's no such thing. It is ours. It is ours. In the Medrash, they already knew, they already knew, they already knew that someday the nations would come and say, you're thieves, you took the land, you're colonialists, imperialists, fascists. And so, in Greshit Rabba, chapter 1, and this is what Rashi brings down, the very first Rashi, the Medrash says, and if the nation shall come to the Jews and say, you thieves, you, you took the land from the Canaanites, they shall answer, the world and all that is in it belongs to the Holy One, blessed be he. When he so chose, he gave it unto you. And when he so chose, he took it from you. He gave it to us. And this is the meaning of the verse, the strength of his deeds that he, that he recount unto his people in order to give unto them the inheritance of the nations. That's why it's, it's ours. By the way, one of the rabbis commented, if the purpose is to speak to the nations and prove to them that God owns the land, why do we bring down the verse, the strength of his deeds that he recount unto his people? I should have said, the strength of his deeds that he recount unto the nations. The answer is, no matter what you tell the nations, they're not going to care. But the problem is not whether the nations believe that the land belongs to the Jews. The problem is that the Jews don't believe that it belongs to the Jews. And therefore, the verse is, the strength of his deed shall he recount unto his people. I'll abide that Jews should believe that it, it belongs to them. So, let's move towards a little break here. Just a few more points. And that is, the tragedy of the, of the Jewish people that for 1900 years had no state of their own, and now they have a state of their own, and continues to exist in the exile continues to live in the exile, not the slightest intention of leaving, not the slightest intention. In South Africa, people sitting on a volcano which is going to explode. Well, some do, do leave, but they go to Melbourne. Who's going to Israel? And the worst part is, there were 600,000 Orthodox Jews living in this country. Totally at home. In Borough Park, there is sheer contentment. Not the slightest comfort, not the slightest 
problem of conscience, absolutely convinced that this is, is New Zion. In Muncie, they are building homes. $400,000 homes. $500,000 homes. $600,000 homes in each, in each room of chandelier. <laughs> happy, luxury, luxury, and happy, content. We are Americans. Sometimes I listen to, to the Bob Grant show, and I listen to these guys calling in from, from Williamsburg, Bar with thick accents, Jews, thick accents. Two minutes after he has just told off some, some Spanish guy with, with an accent, where you from, buddy? What are you, a foreigner? And this fellow calls it and he says, that's giving it to him, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks that he's in America. He doesn't know Bob Grimms. No, he doesn't know the anti-Semite that he is. He's a smart man. If you made $100,000 a year speaking in shuls, you'd also make believe that you like Jews. In any case, God told the Jews to be, to live in a special country. We find in Dvarim, Deuteronomy chapter 4, Moses tells the Jews, Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments that you should do in the midst of the land whither you go to possess. And again, in the same chapter, and the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might do them in the land whither you go over to possess. The Ramban, the Ramban, one of the great commentators, says as follows. The Holy One commanded Moses two things, two things, he said. One, that he should go down to save the people from Egypt. And this would, would have been possible in Egypt itself, or nearby. In other words, if the purpose was to free the Jewish people from slavery, free them, and let them live free in Egypt. But he promised another thing, to take them out of that land totally, and to the place of the Canaanites, meaning Eretz, Israel. Why? The Ibn Ezra, in Varim chapter 4, verse 10, says, listen carefully. For God knew that Israel could not fulfill the mitzvot, the commandments, properly if they would be in countries ruling over them. You hear what he said? Yes, they could keep the commandments, but not properly. Why not properly? Because you'll be influenced. You'll be influenced. The Torah was given to be in a country in which as, as far as, as, as physically possible, there will be no outside influence. You'll be influenced. You'll go to public school or even in yeshiva and you'll have to learn a certain secular curriculum and you'll come out thinking, gee, Jefferson is great. That's the way to go. Jefferson is Judaism. Right on, democracy. And then someday, some rabbi will get up and say, democracy and Judaism do not mix. And you'll say, fascist, racist. <laughs> and you'll really believe it. Because that's how you were raised. So you keep mitzvah. Of course you keep mitzvah. Every Shabbos, he eats chillin with gusto. Of course he eats milk. Of course he keeps the mitzvah. He goes to shul every Shabbos and talks about the stock market. Every, every Shabbos, hey, hey, and Nixon, Nixon, almost beat Phoenix. Almost beat Phoenix. Now God knew that they could not fulfill the commandments properly. And the Sforno, another one of the great, great commentators, also in Dvarim chapter 6, verse 21 says, And since in our servitude, we were unable to acquire the completeness directed by him. God did wondrously to take us out and bring us into the land where we could acquire that completeness. That's the key, the completeness, the completeness. 
properly, do mitzvah properly and completely, and that can only be done if you are in isolation and Judaism believes in isolation. Another concept that does not go over well with people who really were, <coughs> were products of a foreign culture. And finally, just to finish with this, with this point, point here, is a remarkable medrash in the Sifri. In, uh, in Zarim, which says as follows, even after you are in exile, be distinguished with commandments. Place tefillin, make mezuzot on your doorposts, so that they will not be foreign to you when you return. Listen carefully to what he said. Even when you're in exile, do the commandments. Why? So that they should not be foreign to you when you return. That is the reason to keep the mitzvahs in America. You keep the mitzvahs in America because a Jew has to keep mitzvahs. And we have a classic concept that any mitzvah which is related to a person's body is anywhere, both in Israel or outside of Israel. What, does it, what, what can the rabbis possibly mean by this? Remember to keep the mitzvah so that they should not be foreign to you when you get back. Here's a classic concept here that no mitzvah was ever given to the Jew to be kept in the exile. The mitzvahs were only given for the Jew to be kept properly, completely in Eretz Yisrael. Only there. And you should keep it in the exile because Chaval Mor, it's tragic. You're in the exile. So keep it so that when you get back to the place where it was originally meant to be, they won't be foreign to you. You know what to do. Is there ever a greater proof that the Jew is obligated to live in Eretz Israel because only there were, was it ever meant to observe the mitzvah? Let's take a break and then we'll go on to the next thing will be the question of uh, Jews and Gentiles.